I am grateful to Father Roger, thank you, for allowing me to preach today, not only in celebration of the 10th anniversary of my ordination as a deacon, but also because I find the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus very compelling. John preached in the Judean desert a gospel of repentance, which scholars interpret as economic repentance, the forgiveness of debt, and the restoration of the dignity of the impoverished. In this wilderness ministry, John had many followers. They went to him, they were baptized by him, and they stayed with him. They stayed with him, it is assumed, because John's prophecy, and we know it's a prophecy, because the scripture says the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah. These are the words that are used by prophets or about prophets when they want to say something which is likely to provoke or chastise the current regime. <laughs> The word of God which came to John is that the advent of God is imminent. The end of the world is near, and it's time to make things right in your life if you want to be saved. Stay with John, practice justice, and when the Messiah comes, he will save you. And this prophecy would be consistent with the whole of tradition and prophetic history. But we know that Jesus Jesus had a radically different message. Jesus said, wait, the Messiah is here. And he is waiting for you to wake up and recognize him. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to do what the Messiah does until everyone is working together. You are not only not helpless, but you are also the only ones who can power the Jesus movement forward. You are now midwives for the birth of heaven on earth. So why was John important? We see John in all four Gospels. He's got to be important. He is clearly there to fulfill the promise that a messenger would appear to announce the arrival of the Messiah. And, and John had the message half right. It is necessary to repent our transgressions in order to receive the fullness of what God offers. But Jesus, the Jesus half of the message, the half which says there is no heaven without the act of loving each other, without engaging each other, without getting into each other's business, that half didn't really need John, did it? Or did Jesus need John? I can't answer that. No one can answer what God is doing. But I can say that it seems to me that we are given this story about John so that Jesus can speak his gospel more clearly. So that Jesus can say, repent, yes, yes, of course, repent, but go, go, love one another, break bread together, and be as one. So that the world can really hear that heaven on earth depends not on purity codes, not on doctrinal belief or attendance at church, but on restoring equality and bringing justice to all people with love. You know, I grew up thinking just like John. I had a religion which reinforced the idea that if I were good enough, I would be saved in the end. I would get into heaven and that process would be like getting into grad school, you know? <laughs> I couldn't figure that out. But in that way of thinking, God and I were pretty separate. We had a different agenda. But my, I was going to keep my nose clean. And if I had time, I was going to help other people with their noses. But God was going to keep track of these efforts, and then I would get into heaven. Or, or not. 50 years into my life. 50 years. Right? Right? Into my life. It's a little gospel amen over there. Fifty years into my life, I had a personal in-breaking. The word of God came to me from my inner prophet, and I decided to become a deacon. But I'll tell you something. For me, John the Baptist appeared in the lives of my friends 
and called me after having years of long conversations about where God was in the world. The people who became John the Baptist for me, who ordained me, actually, to this ministry, were people who didn't even know what the diaconate was. They were people who talked to me long and hard about the suffering they saw and the ways they had been hurt by churches in that suffering. And I, you know, I was often very reluctant to bring God into it. I understood their alienation and their contempt for the hypocrisy of the institutional churches. I saw it sometimes. It was hard to know what to say. I talked and I talked and I talked about love and justice and the healing of grace, and sometimes I just gave up. But gradually, over long periods of years, and to my complete amazement, they listened. Sometimes the conversation worked. I say this, not because I claim any personal agency here, quite the opposite, quite the opposite. Any good which came to these conversations came directly from God, mostly without my realizing what was happening. My experience was like that of John. I talked about what I believed, but I didn't really think it would work. And after a long, long time, I got it. I finally understood that what happens is that we work inside God who is working inside us. It is synergistic. It is only when we wake up to the fact that we are living like Russian dolls in a family, in a city, in a country, in a world, in the universe, in the heart of God. And that these parts are not separate, but completely interconnected. Only then can we realize that we can claim our power, that we can help bring heaven. And that power, as the presiding bishop likes to say, is the power of love. You, the people of St. John's, know about the power of love. I am here today to testify that the word of God has come to St. John's and shows itself in things known and unknown. I mention these things because it is the story I can tell with accuracy about what Advent means. Advent seemed to take one's whole life. I don't think I'm unique in this. I think we're all somewhere in the midst of waking up that God is waiting for us to do the work we were born to do. Half of my ordained life I have spent with you. I have walked with you into so many acts of love in these last five years. I have asked you to partner with me and allow me to partner with you, and you have never refused me, never. There is such a vibrant sense of love here. You have such a deep, deep willingness to be with and for each other and to take that into the world. And, and I have to say, I'm talking to all of us and to all of you, but especially to my, my partners in the social ministry team who are indefatigable in their work with me. In my first placement, which was sort of like a field ed placement, at a church named St. Stephen's. The rector loved to introduce me by reminding that St. Stephen was often thought of as the first deacon and was beheaded. <laughs> <laughs> I was never sure what to make of that. <laughs> I'm reasonably sure I'm not in danger on that score. <laughs> there is so much more danger, though, in thinking that I am helpless, as I used to think to heal the hearts of those who have been hurt. Because God and I are together in this. God and I and you and God and I and you are all together. So my heart today is full of gratitude for you all, for your hearts of love, for your hands of caring, for your beautiful, beautiful voices, and your ceaseless concern for the hurting world. You have given me so much joy and are such a rich blessing. Thank you.